right so in this uh, lecture we will be discussing important concepts of nuclear chemistry which basically will be focusing on nuclear reactions that involve changes in the nuclear structure we are all familiar with the basic structure of an atom an atom uh, is composed of elementary particles called electrons protons and neutrons the nucleus in the middle which is the densest part of the atom consists of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons and this uh, new these neutrons and protons can collectively be also referred to as nucleons the outermost region of the atom is called the electronic shell and this essentially contains negatively charged electrons revolving around the positively charged nucleus these are the notations for writing these electrons protons and neutrons so in this kind kind of notation what you essentially write you write the abbreviation that is used for this particular element as a subscript in the front sorry as a subscript in the front you write down the charge of that particular particle and on the top in the superscript is written the mass of the particle since electrons are negatively charged right here you see a negative 1 and because they are very light their mass is negligible you see a zero for its mass in case of protons since the charge is positive 1 you see a plus 1 right here and a plus 1 for its mass as well neutrons they are neutral in charge so the charge is zero and the mass is equivalent to a mass of a proton so it's written out as now let's look at what is the notation for let's look at what is a notation for a nucleide a nucleide is essentially just an atom with a particular nuclear composition meaning it has a certain amount of neutrons protons or collectively called nucleons right so if you recall a uh, made all the major characteristics of an atom are dependent on its atomic number what is the atomic number atomic number essentially mm -hmm. is the number of protons present in an atom this is denoted by alphabet z this is essentially the notation of a chemical compound x right here stands for the chemical symbol of an element for example if we are working with carbon it would be written out as c right here Z is the atomic number which is equal to the number of protons that is present in that particular atom in carbon it's essentially 6 A right here is the mass number what is the mass number mass number is total number of nucleons essentially protons and neutrons that are present in an atom if you look at the periodic table you'll see this as carbon 12 which essentially means that it has 6 protons and the mass number is 12 so if the mass number is 12 the number of neutrons in this case is going to be 12 which is the mass number minus number of protons which is 6 what is the number of electrons in this case so if you look at this particular atom it has no charge meaning it's neutral so since it's neutral the charge in this case is zero so the number of electrons is going to be equal to number of protons which is also going to be 6 right now we understand carbon 12 but what is this we have carbon 6 uh, 13 and carbon 14 what does that mean these are essentially the isotopes of carbon so most of the elements occur as a mixture of isotopes in nature what are isotopes atoms with same atomic number meaning they have same number of protons but different mass number so if they have same number of protons but a different mass number that essentially means they will have different number of neutrons these are called isotopes they have identical chemical properties because their atomic number is same but they have very different nuclear properties so what do i mean by that let's look at the carbon uh, isotopes of carbon so different isotopes can be also written out like this so carbon 12 carbon 13 and carbon 14 carbon 12 like we just calculated protons are 6 neutrons are 6 and electrons is also 6 carbon 13 on the other hand protons is 6 but neutrons is 
13 minus 6. So the difference lies in the number of neutrons. And electrons is also equal to number of protons in this case because, again, there is no charge on this particular atom. It's not an ion. Carbon number 14, Z is 6, meaning protons is 6, but neutrons is 8. So you can see here in all these isotopes, the difference is essentially in the number of neutrons. And the number of protons stays the same. So that's what an isotope stands for. And each isotope, because you can see their nuclear properties are different, is referred to as a nuclide. Right, so this is one of the workout problems uh, right here for you. What essentially is asking for you to do is compute the nuclide notation and calculate the number of neutrons, protons, and electrons for the isotope of chlorine, including chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So this is telling you the mass number of the particular atom. How do you know what's the atomic number? Go to the periodic table and look for the atomic number of chlorine because atomic number in case of isotope stays the same. Only thing that changes is the mass number. So you can pause the video right here, compute these numbers, come back and move on to the next slide and that will show you the answers, right? Now, one can ask a question that what keeps this nucleus together? The nucleus is composed of all positively charged protons. And as we know, like charges repel each other. So all the protons are supposed to repel each other. So if they repel each other, what actually keeps them together? To understand that, you have to understand four fundamental forces that essentially uh, keep all the matters or are uh, experienced by all the matter in this universe. So the first one is the gravitational force. This force is the uh, weakest of these all, and the range is infinite, which means that it uh, applies even if you take the matter uh, at infinite distances. You'll still they'll still be exerting gravitational force. Anything that has mass is going to exert some gravitational force. So essentially, all the objects in this universe. Next is a weak nuclear force, which you can see is relatively stronger, but it's still pretty weak. It is it only applies to a very short region, for example, just small nuclear distances, and it only applies to some elementary particles, including electrons and neutrinos. You're not familiar with this, so we're going to skip for this for now. Next type of force is the electromagnetic force, which essentially is present between all the charged particles. Right. So when we say protons repel each other or protons are um, attracted towards electrons or uh, positive attracts negative charged particles, that's essentially electromagnetic force. You can see relatively it's pretty much it's very strong compared to the rest of the forces and the distance that it applies to is also infinite. But again, it's uh, inversely proportional to distance. So if the particles, the farther they go apart, the uh, lesser would be the force. The last force, the most important one right here, is the strong nuclear force. So this is the force of attraction between the nucleus, within the nucleus, that essentially holds the nucleus together. You can see relatively it's very strong, but the range for this is really small, which means that it only applies within the nucleus. As long as everything is in that particular size, in that particular small distance, this force will exert itself and it will exert its effects. But when the distance increases, meaning if anything goes out of that nucleus, this force is no longer effective enough. It becomes negligible as the distance increases. So this is the force that operates among nucleons and keeps the whole nucleus together. Talking about nuclear reactions, what are nuclear reactions? So up until now, you all are familiar with chemical reactions that look like this, right? Where atoms never change their identity. Meaning if you have carbon in one of the reactants, as a product, you will get carbon. If you have hydrogen right here as a product, you will get hydrogen. Atoms are not going to change their identity. Nuclear reactions, on the other hand, change from atom of one element to atom of another element and that's why they are called nuclear reaction because what's happening now is their nuclear identities changing 
in case of a chemical reaction, only electrons that are in the orbitals that are involved. You break bonds, you share bonds, you make new bonds, you share electrons, right? But in case of a nuclear reaction, electrons, more majorly, most of the times, electrons are not involved. What's involved is the protons and the neutrons and other nuclear particles that are present in the nucleus. In case of chemical reaction, we have seen, you probably have read in thermodynamics, that in case of chemical reaction, mass is conserved, energy is conserved. There's a very small change in energy that happens, but most of the times it's very negligible. And the change in mass is pretty negligible. Change in energy is small, but change in mass is negligible. Whereas in case of chemical reactions, if you have, I'm sure you guys have heard about this, nuclear reactions is the new source of can be a replacement for our renewable energy. Why? Because these nuclear reactions are very high in power. They generate or they use up a lot of energy. They can produce a lot of energy. So these reactions are accompanied by a very high change in energy. And why is that? Because there is a very high change in mass that can easily be recorded during these nuclear reactions. And you'll see later on what do I mean when I say there's measurable change in mass. In case of a chemical reaction, the rates are influenced by temperature. They are dependent on the concentration of your reactants, catalyst, if any catalyst is present, and compounds in which the elements occur, right? But in case of a nuclear reaction, these factors do not play any role. There's hardly any effect of temperature or catalyst. These essentially just depend on the number of nuclei that are present. And you'll understand, you'll see, look, we'll look at the kinetics of these nuclear reactions as well. And you'll see that the more uh, nuclei, higher is the number of the nuclei that's present, the faster are these reactions. Right, so when we say higher amount of mass difference in a nuclear reaction causes a change in energy, which is also really high, right? What does that mean? Why is mass related to energy? So every time there is a conversion of mass, that is accompanied by a conversion of energy. And this relationship is given by mass energy equivalence equation given by Einstein. It's written as, it's very popular, you might, guys might have heard of this before, E equals mc squared. Where E is the change, A is the energy, m is the mass, and c is the speed of light in vacuum. It can also be written as delta E equals delta mc squared. Delta E here is the change in energy, meaning change in energy during a nuclear reaction. Delta M is the change in mass, and C again is the speed of light. So if we know either one of these energy difference or mass differences, we can calculate the other component because C is a constant. Now let's look at what is this energy that we are talking about. It's called as nuclear binding energy. What's this energy? Every time an atom is formed from protons, neutrons, and electrons, there's always a change in mass. Some of the mass is always lost. This is known as the mass defect. And since there is loss of mass, it's going to be equivalent loss of energy. And this energy difference is called as the nuclear binding energy. So you can essentially define this as nuclear binding energy as the energy which is produced when the atoms are bound together, meaning all the nucleons, nucleons are coming together and an atom is being produced. And this is the same amount of energy that is needed to break a nucleus apart into its constituent nucleons, meaning protons and neutrons. So whenever, there's a, whenever an atom is formed, the mass of the nucleus is always going to be less than the combined mass of the nucleons. What is the mass of the nucleons? You can calculate that by, if you know the mass of one of the protons and mass of one of the neutrons, you can always calculate what is the mass of the nucleons supposed to be. But once it is formed, the actual mass of the nucleus is a little bit smaller than that. So if you calculate the difference among this, between these, you can figure out what is the mass defect. And once we know what's the mass defect, we can convert it into energy using delta E equals delta mc squared. This energy, the unit that is usually used for this energy is electron volts or MeV, which is mega electron volts. Essentially, uh, one, uh, 10 to the power 6 electron volts is going to be equal to 1 mega electron volt. Right? 
Joules is one of the common forms of energy, common units of energy, right? So we also have a conversion factor that relates joules into electron volts, which will come handy. And one joule is equal to one kilogram meter square uh, per uh, second square. And you're going to see all of these conversion factors are going to come handy. What's important when you're using this equation is that delta M should always be in kilograms or kilograms per mole, whatever it is, but it has to be in kilograms. You cannot use grams whenever working with this particular equation. So let's take a look at one of these workout examples. Iron 56 is an extremely stable nucleate. Compute binding energy per nucleon for iron 56 mass of this atom is given to you mass of one of the protons this is also what a proton essentially means can be depicted as one of these hydrogen atoms mass of the proton is this mass of the neutron is also given to you so you guys can think about this pause the video try and think about this and then we can compute our numbers so essentially what's given to you is iron 56 is your atom first thing we'll have to do is it's asking us for binding energy per nucleon remember that it's not just asking binding energy it's binding energy per nucleon what is the binding energy binding energy can can be calculated from the difference in mass for that first we have to figure out what is the difference in mass difference in mass we just saw the formula is mass of the nucleons minus mass of the nucleus nucleus is given to us which is the mass of the atom since electrons are essentially zero right in mass mass of the nucleons can be found out by adding up the total mass of the protons and total mass of the neutrons for this we first should figure out how many protons are present and how many neutrons are present in here mass number is given but we don't know what is the atomic number of iron. So atomic number never changes. Remember, go back to your periodic table, look up for the atomic number of iron, and then you can start computing answers for this question. So if you had looked at your periodic table, you would have found something like this, which means that the atomic number of iron is 26. So if atomic number is 26, that means that number of protons is 26 meaning number of neutrons would be the mass number which is given to you in question as 56 minus 26 which is 30 so now that we know number of protons and number of neutrons we can calculate the mass of the nucleons and then using the mass of nucleons we can calculate the mass difference right so how do you calculate that the mass difference will be total mass of nucleons which is number of uh, protons times the mass of each proton and number of neutrons times the mass of neutrons this is the mass of nucleons minus the mass of the atom which is given to you in question and all these are also given to you in question so if you plug in the numbers it will give you your answer in 0 0.52847 amu atomic mass unit now remember atomic mass unit is same as gram per mole so you can simply write this as gram per mole next we can convert this mass directly into energy using the formula of binding energy which is delta e equals delta mc square but what's important there is that mass has to be in kilograms so our first step is going to be conversion of this mass into kilograms we cannot get rid of mole because you cannot just get rid of mole like that, right? Mole is very important in chemistry. So if you convert grams to kilograms using the conversion factor, it will convert into kilograms per mole, right? So let's do that. So if you start with this grams per mole, always write down what you have, which is grams per mole. What is the conversion factor that relates grams and kilograms? It's essentially 1000 grams is one kilogram. We want to get rid of grams, so we're going to divide this by grams, which is 1000 grams, and multiply by kilos. Grams and grams get cancelled, you're left with kilograms per mole. Next, multiply it with C square, and that gives you your binding energy. The unit for binding energy is going to be the kilogram, meter square, second inverse square, and mole inverse. But we know that we can go from this unit into joules, 
using this conversion factor again you don't have to memorize any of this this will be given to you in your exam you just have to know when to use what right so next we can use this conversion factor kilogram meter square second inverse square inverse gets cancelled and what you're left with is essentially joules per mole now remember this is joules per mole you cannot get rid of mole but at the same time we do not want mole we want to calculate binding energy of this particular atom so how can you go from moles to an atom or to a nuclei we will be using Avogadro's number which is one mole equals the Avogadro's number right so we'll use this conversion factor to figure out binding energy per nucleus or per atom so this is what you have joules per mole one mole we want to get rid of the mole so we multiply by one mole and we divide by nuclei which is the Avogadro's number so mole and mole get cancelled and you have your answer in joules per nuclei or joules per atom now remember the question is not asking you what is the binding energy of this atom if the question was asking that this would be your answer you would can you can simply convert this into joules or if you want to convert it into equivalence is sorry electron volts you can convert that using this conversion factor but the question is not this the question is what is the binding energy per nucleon so to figure that out there's an extra step step which means per nucleon so you will have to divide this number by number of nucleons that are present and what is that 56 26 protons 30 neutrons total number of nucleons 56 so we take this one nuclei has 56 nucleons you divide by that that gives you a joules per nucleon and if the question let's say it's a multiple choice and all your options are in electron volts you can convert this into electron volts using this conversion factor which relates joules and electron volts right here right so now you have your answer in electron volts per nucleon let's say your options are in mega electron volts you can simply do that conversion as well which is 10 to the power 6 one mega electron volt is 10 to the power 6 electron volts which will give you binding energy per nucleon of 8.79 right so this is like the farthest extent that i can think of with this kind of question you might be just asked to calculate the mass difference or just the binding energy per mole or just the binding energy per nucleus or binding energy for this particular atom then you just stop right here if it's asking you to go to nucleon then you go till this step right okay